What is the most opportune time to be tempted? Why, never, you might appropriately exclaim. Yes, from our perspective, we would prefer mostly that temptation never came our way. But from Satan's perspective, sometimes are more opportune than others, as Luke implies in his story of the temptation of Jesus. We will consider briefly what is the most opportune time to be tempted, in part so that we can be prepared for it when it inevitably will come. Temptations to sin will come in big and small ways, and we will need the mercy and grace of our Lord even to complete the ministry calling he has given us. But sometimes we face a temptation to leave the ministry, to quit his calling, or to fall away from our path of discipleship. This is a different kind of temptation, one that Jesus also faced. We can learn from Jesus and from noticing a pattern in the temptations of the devil as they came to Jesus. Let's take a look. I'm going to be reading from Luke 4, just the first two verses, and then verses 12 and 13 at the end. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where the, for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And then down in verse 12, Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. I'll be reading Mark 8, verses 27 through 33. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They answered him, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning aside and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then finally, Mark 14, verses 32 through 38. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come to a time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. The devil's temptations in Luke 4 seem a bit unsophisticated and simple. If Jesus really met the devil in all his sophisticated trickiness, wouldn't the temptations have been more subtle, more 5149 kind of decisions? Yet I hear the story recorded in Luke 4 and think, these offers would not have tempted me. But why not? Jesus knew that the devil had been given authority on the planet to harm human life since the fall. So much suffering, war, hatred, jealousy, wanton cruelty, and reckless abandonment to sin. All this human carnage because, for the time being, the devil was running things. What would you be willing to trade so that you could be the king of the world, or the governor of your state, or the mayor of your city? A little falsehood, a little deception, a little rule-bending for the greater good. A small price to pay, really, for the sake of all the good that it would make possible for you to do. Actually, come to think of it, perhaps many people would have made that trade. Indeed, perhaps many already have. In two of the three temptations in Luke 4, the devil taunts Jesus, If you are the Son of God, this scene happens after the baptism of Jesus, where Jesus heard the voice from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Jesus knows he's the Son of God, so why not demonstrate it once and for all? Satan's temptation comes to Jesus at his transition from carpenter into traveling preacher and king of God's kingdom. He knows his identity, but has not yet set down any patterns or lines he won't cross. He has scripture, but it's not like he's done this before. So as he transitions into his new role, specific questions remain open. Okay, you are the son of God, but what does that really mean? Satan shows up with temptations about Jesus' use of power for his own purposes, power even for excellent purposes. But Jesus doesn't fall for these temptations, and he uses scripture to fend off the devil's deceptions, even when the devil tries to use scripture to bolster his own lies. Then Luke tells us that the devil left Jesus alone until he would reappear at an opportune time. Jesus meets up with many unclean spirits in the intervening chapters of the gospel. Still, he doesn't seem particularly tempted or even much troubled by any of them. But then, in Mark 8, 
we see the climax of the first half of the Gospel of Mark as Peter declares to Jesus, you are the Christ. Mark gives us, in Peter's declaration, the answer to the question that has been on everybody's lips. Who then is this? Jesus affirms that answer, but tells them to say nothing about it. He then begins to tell his disciples, for the first time, what it means that he is the Christ. Where up to now, the question was, who is Jesus? Now the question, for the remainder of his time until his death, the question is, what does it mean that he is the Christ? Jesus answers this question, it will mean voluntarily saying yes to suffering and death. Peter says, no, that's not what I meant. You don't have to die. I won't allow it. Or something like that. This is when Satan appears again in Jesus' life. This is an opportune time. Jesus is again transitioning, now from traveling preacher and teacher to master discipler, focusing increasingly on his disciples and preparing them for the day when he will be taken to heaven. Jesus knows that he must give new and even paradoxical meaning to the title he now bears, Christ. This, then, is his new task. The disciples must understand the nature of his identity and purpose because they will be called to follow him and live and die as he did, as servants, not as conquerors. Jesus tells Peter that he is speaking with the voice and temptation of Satan. Peter, of course, only meant well. He loved Jesus, sincerely, I believe, and was loyal to him. But he didn't see as Jesus did. So his perspective was limited, and his loyal urging, you don't have to die, was an error. I don't think Jesus would have been so harsh if it weren't so tempting. Oh, Peter, 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 you're so funny. Good one. <laughs> oh, Peter, what you don't know is that I do have to die. Jesus didn't respond to Peter, as he did the night Jesus washed Peter's feet, with kind of bemusement affection, and yet insistence. No, on this occasion, Jesus responded with fierce determination and resistance because the temptation to try to save his life, to use his mighty power for his own purposes, was a real one. Jesus overcame temptation that evening, but it must be said that he was tempted by these words. He responds with fierce anger, anger he reserves not for his befuddled but beloved disciple, but for his immortal enemy. Finally, of course, Jesus meets up with Satan one more time at the end of his life, the night before his death. Jesus confronts the temptation of Satan head on, the temptation to reject the cross and save your life, or rather to drink the cup that the Father offers him to go on to suffer and die. Jesus trusts that the Father will remove the cup when he has completed the task and restore him to life in the resurrection. Jesus did not want to go through the suffering or the shame of the cross, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 tells us, but he did so for the joy that was set before him something Satan did not see and could not have comprehended. As Jesus was on the cross, Satan believed he had won. Still, his victory was as short-lived as Judas's, because in Jesus' death, the sacrifice for sin that sealed humanity's mortal sentence was overturned, and death and Satan were defeated for good. We face the same temptations Jesus faced. But unlike Jesus, we don't have a perfect record of staring the devil down, seeing through the devil's deceptions, and emerging from conflict victorious and stronger for it. We know we sin and fail in big and small ways, regularly, even daily. But I wanted to alert us to one of Satan's critical strategies. He used it with Jesus, and he does so with us. Satan tempts us when we experience transition. Our lives are marked by periods of stasis, interrupted by periods of change, then back to stasis. At times we experience long periods of transition, at other times we enjoy long stretches of continuity. But this is the nature of human life. When we set healthy patterns for our own discipleship during periods of calm and quiet, we can grow as disciples, deepen in our relationship with God and God's people, and slowly and quietly discern his calling and work in our lives. But during transitions, during opportune times, say when we go off to college or university, or when we move somewhere else for graduate school, or when we get married, or when we are starting or changing jobs, or even when we are on vacation or traveling for work, when we have our routine interrupted, Satan can come along and tempt us with an opportunity or a deception or an enticement that he would not even have been able to tempt us with when we were on our home turf in our normal life. During periods of transition, when our identity, purpose, and character are open to being redefined, that is when Satan can present a powerful enticement to take up a new way of being in the world, a new choice that we wouldn't have made before, but perhaps newly looks attractive or an attractive choice that newly looks available because of our new circumstances. I believe that COVID-19 pandemic produced a loss of continuity for many people. 
In the unchosen transitions, many fell to a temptation to redefine the terms of their faith and forsake gathering with and praying with fellow believers. Healthy patterns of faithfulness fell by the wayside, and new, less faithful patterns took their places. Transitions will come. Some are happy events, like marriages and births. Some are unwelcome, but expected, like the deaths of our aging parents. And some come unbidden and unpleasant, but press in on us nonetheless, like economic hardships, cancer diagnoses, difficult or lost pregnancies, or global pandemics. In those transition times, we will sometimes hear the same voice, you do not have to die. You don't have to take your faith quite so seriously. You don't have to use so much of your time or money or energy for that ministry. That voice won't come to us in a growly, obviously demonic voice. No, no, that voice will come to us when it comes at all in the voice of a friend, a mother, a sibling, a spouse, someone who loves us and only wants what's best for us, but who, like Peter with Jesus, doesn't know the old story. What sounds like wisdom is a temptation from the pit of hell. You don't have to die. As we go through the temptations that are no doubt ahead for each of us, we must be listening, not to the voice of prudence or to the voice of moderation, to the voice of our Lord, who calls us to join him, to take up our own crosses and follow him, not just to suffering and death, but also to redemptive and powerfully victorious life. His is the voice in these times that we most want and most need to be listening to. And finally, just a few questions for reflection. Number one, think through a few of your most recent transitions. Do you see evidence of heightened temptation during those times? What did you do to protect yourself from these temptations? Where do you feel that perhaps you succumbed? And secondly, where do you go from here? What transitions do you see ahead for you, professionally or personally, welcome or unwelcome? Have you heard the temptation Jesus heard in the voice of a beloved friend or family member? You don't have to die. What can you do to help your friend understand that your situation so that they can help you weather the transition with your faith intact and deepened? Finally, thank you for watching this video. If you did, uh, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. And if you think that this message could be helpful to someone you know, uh, please forward on the link to them. That really helps me get the word out.